All right, this is Tanner Dykin, again, pastor at uh, Open Door Baptist Church, and uh, I'm back doing another uh, review video on the debate that I had with uh, Matt McDougall uh, just last month, and uh, I'll be doing another debate. Uh, once again, I'll just say that I'll be doing another debate next month, the uh, 18th and 19th, uh, I believe, and uh, I went over the, here, I went over the uh, final night that we did the uh, back and forth kind of question answer thing and I found a few things that I wanted to uh, go back and, and address here some things that Matt said and uh, mostly just uh, places where he's uh, thrown out a scripture reference and uh, he's he, he didn't go to the passage itself and, and read it uh, he, he basically just threw out a passage and and uh, basically said a couple of words about what that passage uh, is and, and why he's quoting it uh, or, or giving us a reference to it. And uh, so I, I, I wanted to go back and, and actually, you know, slow down and, and look at those passages. I understand, you know, of course, in debate, you don't have a lot of time uh, to, to go through and, and look at them, but it, 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 can, it can seem pretty impressive when somebody has a list of scripture references and uh, they just intersperse them out in a sentence and they throw them out and uh, see what, you know, what sticks. And, and uh, it, it, it seems impressive when they do this, but it's a, it's a completely other thing, uh, you know, aside from just throwing the references out there. It's, a, it's another thing to go to the passages and, and see what they actually say. And so th there were a few things that Matt just uh, just spoke and he, and he said that I wanted to uh, go back and kind of kind of look at more closely. Most uh, a lot of uh, what he said uh, to the questions that I directly asked him, that I wanted to go back and see uh, you know, what he was saying there and, and see if it really addresses the point or uh, whatnot. Uh, and uh, then we'll go on to some uh, of his answers to audience questions. And uh, and so, yeah, we'll we'll do that. I've already re uh, recorded this uh, once. I did it uh, last night and uh, it uh, it didn't really um, it didn't really satisfy me. Uh, I, I went far longer than I thought uh, I was going to. I got rambly a little like I'm doing now, uh, but I wanted to try and cut that time down a little bit and uh, state myself a little bit more clearly. And so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll get into it with uh, the first question uh, that I asked Matt. The first question was, of course, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, and, and verses 8 through 10, uh, where the works that uh, do not save us, right, uh, that, that we're, you know, uh, that we're saved not of works, lest any man should boast, are then identified in the next verse as the works of the Christian life. And I wanted to see what, you know, his thoughts were uh, on that and, uh, so we'll we'll see what he has to say. Okay, um, there's no distinction between those two verses. They're the same kind of works. Verse ten uh, says that good works should follow a Christian. Verse nine says that these type of works do not save. Good works should accompany a Christian's life, but they do not save. What is being in Christ, as verse ten mentions, that is accomplished by faith in God at baptism. Colossians 2 and verse 12. All right, so uh, there was his uh, first uh, uh, response to the question. We'll get to uh, Colossians 2 in the uh, next question. Uh, but I just thought that this was a, uh, a complete uh, non-answer to, to the question that I uh, gave. Essentially what he was uh, sort of getting at was he was, he was distinguishing the uh, good works here in verse in verse 10 and in verse 9 uh, the works that God has ordained here uh, he was distinguishing them from works which save uh, and this is this is just a, a, again something that's completely unwarranted that he is uh, he's bringing into the text uh, the, the passage does not distinguish these works from works which save us uh, it's doing the exact opposite. It is using a generic term, works, for both verse 9, you know, not of works lest any man should boast, 
and for the good works which we do, right, which are ordained of God. It's a generic term that's being used. Uh, and what he is, uh, the distinction he's trying to make is just completely unwarranted. And uh, so I, I thought that that was a real, really a non-answer to uh, the question. Uh, that he just apparently wasn't, um, he, he, what, he just wasn't addressing the passage itself. He, he was building a, a sort of imaginary uh, philosophical system first or, or sort of building it around the passage uh, in order to, to, to come to the passage through that philosophical system and interpret it uh, in that way instead of, of drawing out from the passage what it is saying. So that was his not first non-answer. Uh, let's see what else he has to say to the second question, uh, which was about Colossians 2 and uh, Romans 4. Uh, Colossians 2 is uh, often seen um, as, it's, as it's read um, uh, as identifying circumcision with baptism. Uh, that seems, uh, you know, perhaps to be the case in the passage that, that the circumcision, the new circumcision, is baptism uh, itself, or it's identified symbolically with uh, baptism. Uh, and yet Romans 4 says, uh, in verse 10 and 11, that, um, uh, bat that circumcision was not uh, the occasion of anyone being declared righteous in the Old Testament. The first, uh, the, the one to, to receive baptism or circumcision as a sign from the Lord was Abraham, and yet Abraham was counted righteous before he was circumcised. And so uh, that was the question that I had I put to Matt to see what he'd say, and here's his response. Okay, Tanner, it's a good question. Colossians 2 and uh, 11 through 13 says that baptism is the point we are buried and raised with Christ. That is when we enter a covenant relationship with Christ. No one can be saved outside of Christ, and this is just another verse proving that there is an action we can do to get there. All right. Uh, so there's uh, his response to that. Uh, again, it, it, it was sort of, uh, I, I didn't really feel that there was much interaction with uh, the, the argument that I was making itself. Um, the the, the 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 passage identifies uh, is, especially as, as Matt was uh, saying that he accepts that, that baptism is identified as uh, being the new circumcision uh, but if that's the case then uh, we can only say about baptism what we say about circumcision that's that's a, a little point that I, I picked up from the theologian uh, the Old Testament uh, theologian Michael Heiser and I think it's very um, pertinent that if if baptism is identified as the new circumcision in the New Testament then we should only say about baptism what we can uh, rightfully say about circumcision uh, Circumcision can be used to talk about uh, how God is gracious to his people. Uh, baptism also can be used to talk about how God is gracious to his people. But circumcision was not the substance of the grace of God in the Old Testament. It was simply a sign and seal of it. In the same way in the New Testament, baptism is not the substance of the grace of God in salvation, but it's only a sign and seal of uh, the righteousness of God, as, as Romans 4, uh, 10 through 11 tell us. And so again, I thought there was uh, not, much, not much interaction there. Uh, the final question I had for Matt was to just go uh, thematically to uh, the book of Matthew. Uh, in Matthew uh, 5, uh, 17, uh, Jesus said he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. He did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That is to fulfill the, the righteousness of the law. Uh, but Jesus also used the same uh, terminology, the same wording uh, in his baptism in the book of Matthew in, in chapter 3, that he said to uh, John, uh, suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, to fulfill all righteousness. And so that seems, at least on a thematic level, that Jesus is saying that he was baptized and he fulfilled the 
righteousness that is of baptism on our behalf, that is the obedience that is of baptism on our behalf. And so uh, we'll see what Matt had to say about uh, that point that I, I brought to his attention. No. Jesus was baptized in the baptism of John. Uh, the New Testament baptism is um, where we contact his death, burial, and resurrection. That hasn't that hadn't happened yet when Jesus was baptized. The baptism of John is no longer good in this side of, of the cross. And we can see that if you look at Acts 19, if you want to note this. Acts 19, verses 1 through 5, will tell you people were baptized in the baptism of John. And they had to be rebaptized into the baptism of Christ. Okay, so uh, there was his uh, response to that. Um, he tries, at least here, to to bring up a point that would that would kind of uh, you know maybe help him out a little bit. And that's this idea that he can make a distinction between the baptism of John in. Uh, Jesus' lifetime, and then the baptism of the New Testament after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, I've yet to hear anything, Matt, say anything uh, substantive to defend that the baptism of John and the baptism of the church uh, are, are to be taken as two separate things rather than just a continuation of something. Uh, my view of, of how this works is that John the Baptist began to uh, baptize, uh, you know, that, that, that he took the, uh, the uh, Gentile conversion uh, ritual, uh, that uh, the Gentiles would be brought in, they would be uh, educated in the Torah, they would be uh, circumcised, and their conversion to uh, Israel would uh, be culminated in uh, this baptismal ritual uh, that they would go before everyone and they would identify themselves with the priesthood of Israel by undergoing a ritual washing, which was uh, which was taken from the priestly rites in the uh, the book of the law, and uh, so it be, in my view it begins there that that John began to baptize that Jesus of course he picked up this. Uh, he was baptized by John, and then he taught his followers to baptize and be baptized uh, in his earthly ministry and to continue to do so after his, uh, after his ascension into heaven. Uh, I see no scriptural warrant for breaking up the, uh, the, the various administrations of baptism. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I don't see that. Uh, he mentioned Acts 19, you know, of course, here uh, in a previous part of this series going through the uh, debate. Uh, I addressed chapter 19 and I would just point everyone to, uh, to uh, that, I believe, in the uh, second video in this uh, series. And uh, so with that, we'll go on ahead and, and we'll uh, continue on. Uh, the next part will be uh, some questions that were drawn from the audience that I wanted to look at. Okay. Next question for Matt. How does a sinful and unsaved man produce the working obedience you're talking about? How does a dead, they snuck in, they stuck in uh, two questions here. How does a dead, Ephesians 2, 1, not seeking God, Romans 3, enemy of God, Romans 5, produce working obedience? All right. A person produces a working obedience by hearing and understanding the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We all know that hearing is a work. Um, you can't preach to a dead person and expect them to do anything. Hearing and understanding is something we have to do in order to have a working obedience, in order to know what we need to do to be saved. Uh, some people accept the call for obedience to the gospel, and some people reject it. The New Testament is full of these kind of accounts. Acts 13 and verse 36. Uh, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life behold we turn it to the gentiles 
So they had the choice, the option. Working obedience is comes from inside yourself. Do you want to be saved? It's a free will option that everybody has. And the Jews in Acts 13 prove that when they themselves deny and judge themselves unworthy to everlasting life. Okay, there, uh, there was his, uh, uh, you know, answer to that uh, question, and uh, he he goes uh, to uh, Acts uh, chapter thirteen, and uh, he he's he's trying to say that the fact that these people rejected the gospel means that they were not totally depraved or that the option was uh, there for them if they would only stir themselves up to take it, if they would only judge themselves worthy of everlasting life, then they, uh, they could have attained to the gospel. Uh, the problem is, is that, of course, this is just a, a narrative about how some people rejected Christ. And uh, it's completely consistent with the, uh, the working of total depravity in mankind. Uh, of course, uh, we as sinners uh, in times past, we as dead in our sins, as the children of Satan, as slaves uh, to him and to sin, uh, of course, we, we would reject the gospel left to our own uh, devices, left to, to our own resources. Uh, I believe that that's what's going on here that these people rejected the gospel out of their own enslaved sinful hearts and uh, that they they reject the gospel so uh, it, it just doesn't it doesn't show it, it didn't show anything here I don't think to uh, that they uh, were able to positively uh, receive the gospel under their own power and so now let's uh, let's go to the next uh, point if I do everything God requires me to do, what do I have to boast in? I only did what God had already asked me to do. No room for boasting there. All right. Oh, just a uh, just a note. Uh, I have um, I have uh, cut this video um, just to save on time. I I, I basically just cut out uh, dead air and. Uh, uh, my own speaking so that we don't uh, uh, so we can just get to what Matt is saying I haven't cut out uh, what Matt is saying in these in these sections where he's uh, answering I haven't edited the, edited them in any way and uh, you know just just so that uh, since you see you saw that uh, little jump cut there uh, I wanted to uh, you know reassure everybody I'm playing what Matt has said I haven't put word, words into his mouth I haven't I changed them in any way. You can go and watch the debate both on uh, my YouTube channel and the uh, Preacher Feature page uh, ran by uh, on Facebook, ran by uh, Matt's uh, friends. And so, uh, I just want to reassure everybody of that. So let's hear Matt's uh, response to this question. Okay, so there's nothing to boast about when you do what you have been commanded to do. When your dad tells you to mow the yard and you mow the yard, you're just doing what he said. Jesus makes reference to this principle in Luke 17, 10. When we obey God's commands, there's nothing to boast about. It's not a work of boasting. Those aren't the works that are condemned in Romans 2 and verse 9. But this is what Jesus says in, in Luke 17 and verse 10. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Okay, uh, so his uh, answer to that question, uh, which was, was was directed at me, but uh, you know we each had the opportunity to uh, uh, either re uh, to respond to the question and and some of what uh, uh, the other was was saying to that question. Um, for this, he goes to Luke seventeen ten, uh, which he he's uh, trying to use to show that. Uh, if, uh, if we uh, obey, if we work, uh, then uh, we, we cannot take, uh, we cannot uh, 
uh, take glory uh, from from doing these works. Um, and so he, he, he goes here. Uh, the, the full text uh, of the passage, Luke 17, verse 7, uh, says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Uh, the first observation I'd like to, um, to make out of this passage is that uh, the servant here, is not doing his duty uh, in this context, these works that he's doing. He's not doing his duty uh, from a position of outside the household, trying to get into the household. And he's not doing these duties of his in order to gain a reward. He's in fact doing it from a position of inside the household, in fact from a position of bondage, to the household. He, he's doing these things of constraint. He's a slave in the household uh, and uh, he uh, is not doing it for a uh, any kind of uh, uh, a great reward. He's a servant. Um, he's supposed to do what his master tells him to, uh, to do here. Um, and so uh, I don't see how this is, is at all um, uh, talking about how we're justified uh, or that works by which we are justified uh, are not uh, grounds of boasting. It, it, in fact, doesn't seem to say anything like that at all to me. Uh, what this is saying is for those who are Christ's already, for those who are in his household, for those who are already servants of him that we ought to obey him and we ought to obey him and take no credit for our obedience. And that is explained uh, later on uh, in, in the scripture anyway, that even our obedience to him as his servants are a product of the spirit of God within us, that, that, that he works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, and so I, I don't see that this is... is applicable to justification at all. Uh, Jesus himself doesn't make that application. He's just saying, be a diligent but humble servant. And uh, so I don't see why he is drawing this arbitrary connection between this passage and a doctrine of uh, justification. I just don't see it. Uh, and beside that, Romans 4 tells us that if we are justified by works, then we have a reason to glory, right? If Abraham were justified by works, he would have a reason to glory. Uh, if we work, then the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt, that which is owed to us, that which uh, uh, we have labored for uh, in order to receive. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So, uh, I don't see how this uh, over this passage uh, overthrows that principle in Romans four, which is given to us in the context of justification. Uh, I don't see how that overthrow this passage in in Luke seventeen, which is not about justification, overthrows a clear passage about justification. That if it is by works, then it is of debt and a reason to glory. So uh, I think that I, we, I want to take what Jesus is saying in its whole context. I don't want to just uh, clip out little snippets of what Jesus is saying and uh, try to construct a, uh, 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 a doctrine that's not congruent with what he was actually saying at the time. So uh, let's uh, go on ahead and uh, look at uh, the next portion. And this is uh, going to be a big one and it's likely going to take a little while to get through.
All right. Tanner, God calls men through the gospel by the conditions he has ordained and by no other means. He grants mercy to who he pleases by means of Christ's blood. The only way I can be justified, and that by God, is if I submit to the to their sovereign king's decree. How does any of this rob God of this sovereignty? Uh, maybe another way of phrasing that question. Um, how does believing that we need to do something in order to be saved rob God of his sovereignty? Okay, my response to that, Tanner, is uh, it does not go rob God of his sovereignty to accept his gospel plan of salvation. He has complete sovereign control over who he's going to save. According, Take note of these verses. According to Matthew 7 and verse 21, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, he's going to save the obedience. Works of obedience are, uh, works of obedience are essential to salvation. My adversary is saying there's nothing you can do, and I'm going to tell you what you can do to be saved from your sins. Which of those sounds like a gospel preacher? If you want to be saved by Jesus' blood, then here's what you need to do. Believe in Jesus. That's John 8 and verse 24. Or repent of your sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Confess Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And wash away your sins by faith in water baptism, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, and Mark 16, 16. All right, so uh, there we go. Uh, that's what I was referring to at the uh, beginning of this part, that there were, there were a lot of passages that were just kind of thrown out and, uh, and left to, to lie there in the middle. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, I'd just like to take this time and, and look at each of those questions. First, he gives three uh, passages that he thinks uh, generally tell us uh, that obedience is necessary in order to... Uh, receive justification in order to uh, initially be uh, saved. Uh, and then he gives uh, four points. And, and between those four points, he has uh, about uh, uh, six passages uh, or so that, uh, that he believes uh, shows the uh, progression of, of things that we must do uh, in order to, to receive uh, forgiveness. Uh, and so we'll uh, just go through each of these passages and uh, see what he, uh, what he, uh, uh, how they, how they stand up in support of what he was saying. So first, we'll look at those passages about obedience for salvation. Uh, first, he quote, or he he throws out uh, Matthew seven verse uh, twenty one. Uh, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, so he throws that reference uh, out there, and uh, he uh, believes, uh, apparently, that this is telling us that we must, uh, in order to get the forgiveness of or in order to, to gain the kingdom of heaven, we must uh, do we must perform the will of uh, the Father. The uh, problem is, again, uh, is that this individual reference, this individual verse, uh, has a context. And that context explains to us what the, what the verse is saying. Let's look at the context after it first. In verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Uh, Jesus here saying uh, that uh, there will be many people who come before him with works, with things that they have done, and thinking that that automatically gets them into the kingdom if they have done these things. Uh, of course, that's not that's not true. He says, I never knew you. Uh, and as uh, Matt pointed out at one point in the debate, uh, even Judas Iscariot, that even he did 
uh, miracles during the ministry of Jesus. Yet the Lord will say to him, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Uh, and so uh, you, we see that there will be many who come with things that they have done, things that they uh, believe they have worked, uh, and that they uh, should get heaven if they do these things, uh, and it will not be given to them. And so I think that using this passage um, to say that there's something that we can do to put the Lord in uh, a position where he has to save us, uh, it, it, uh, it just borders on committing the same sin that this passage is warning against. But then there's the previous context of, the, of verse 21, uh, backing up to verse 15. And if we understand what's going on here, uh, it's very obvious what Jesus is getting at is not that these people do the will of the Father in heaven in order to receive uh, the forgiveness of their sins or, or the, the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, but because of who they are because they've been made new in Jesus. In verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every tree bringeth forth good fruit, but uh, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. He's talking about evidences of a person's nature. By their fruits ye shall know them. And I would say that by their fruits ye shall know whether they simply say, Lord, Lord, and they do not the will of their Father in heaven, then ye shall know that they are not a good tree. But if they say, Lord, Lord, and they do the will of their Father in heaven, you will know uh, that they are his, that they uh, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. By their fruits ye shall know them. Uh, it's not that they... Uh, produce good fruits in order to become a good tree. Rather, they produce good fruits because they're already a good tree. Uh, they uh, do the will of their Father which is in heaven because they are already his children. And uh, it's not the other way around. You don't do the will of the Father in order to become his child. Rather, you become his child and then you do the works of uh, which he has, has asked us to do, which please him, which, which uh, he delights to see us doing. Uh, the next passage he goes to is Hebrews 5 and uh, verse 8, or verse 10. Uh, well, A through 10 is what we'll read anyway. Um, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So talking about Jesus Christ and his priestly office, it says that he is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Uh, the main point of this passage is not how we get into a, a covenant relationship with Christ where he does the priestly office for us. Rather, it's ambiguous. Uh, it is simply saying that, uh, on that point anyway, it is simply saying that he is the savior of a group of people which is marked by the fact that they obey him. Whether or not they obey him in order to get into that group is not uh, spelled out in the text. Uh, or whether or not they uh, are in him, and so obeying him, they evidence that they are um, that they are uh, in him uh, is again just not uh, specified in the text. Uh, it, it 
by itself just simply says he is the author of eternal salvation to a group and what all this group has in common is that they obey him and so it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't uh, tell us that we have to obey that we have to do works of obedience as Matt would like to say uh, in order to uh, get into Christ or in order for him to be our Savior the final passage for obedience, and remember, there's a lot of passages that he's throwing out here, uh, is uh, in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There, those are two verses. I backed up one just to, to pull in that this is talking about uh, Christ here and, and, and about his coming. And all it says here again is that when he comes, he will judge those who are disobedient to the gospel. It does not here say that, uh, that obedience to works, uh, that that our effort positively as 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 uh believers in jesus christ that our works are the thing which get us into christ rather it's taking a negative statement here and it's saying those who do not obey christ those who do not obey him they are destroyed with uh his flaming fire that, that he comes and takes vengeance on them he judges them uh it does not make a positive statement about how we get into Christ here, how we are, um, uh, how we we get into a covenant relationship with Him, how He forgives us of our sins. This is a judgment passage. Uh, it it is not giving us any direct um, uh, uh, instruction or, or 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 exhortation or or doctrine about how it is that we are are saved so uh you know there's that and, and beside that the the uh phrase here uh, that they obey not the gospel or other phrases that uh, that exhort us to obey the gospel um that does not mean that there are works being done that we uh, uh that we have to go and be baptized or that we have to go and uh, openly uh, do a work of uh, profession or, or, or confessing Christ before so many people uh, or uh, whatnot. Uh, all it is saying is that they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they uh, believe it. Uh, that can be exactly what the expression obey the gospel is meaning. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean obey by working but obey by trusting and that that would be perfectly consistent with uh, the uh, doctrine of sola fide and uh, many people take the passage to uh, be like that in fact i believe that's the traditional uh, understanding of that phraseology to obey the gospel is to um is to to, to hear and to trust in jesus christ so, you know, there's that. Uh, those were the passages he brought up about uh, obedience. And now he moves on to a few passages uh, about, um, about the uh, plan of salvation, uh, as restorationists will uh, call it. And, of course, the first one is non-controversial. I'll just, uh, you know, I'll skip over that. John 8, 24, uh, that, that we have to obey the gospel. Um, or we or we have to believe the gospel. We have to believe on Jesus Christ, and uh, so I'll just I'll just gloss over that for a moment. The the second point, uh, past believing in Jesus, uh, he says is to repent of sins. Uh, in Luke thirteen verse three, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Uh, so repentance here. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Um, he takes this to be a second thing that, that has to be done uh, apart from uh, having faith in Jesus Christ, and uh, yet uh, I don't believe that. Um, I believe that repentance is necessary. 
as do uh, most uh, Protestants. We believe that repentance is necessary. But what does repentance mean? Uh, the, the, the Greek word, of course, just means to turn, to, to, to change one's mind, to turn the mind. Uh, and that is perfectly consistent with faith, uh, simply being a, another way of talking about the same thing denoted by the word faith, that we turn away from ourself, from self-reliance, from the uh, reliance that we have on our sinful ways in order to trust in Jesus Christ. In other words, it is the motion of turning from sin to look to Jesus Christ. It is, it is one unified thing. Uh, and so when we read repent, we're just reading about the other side of the same coin as faith, that to have faith in Christ means to turn away from self to trust in him. And so, uh, yeah, repentance is, uh, is necessary for salvation because it is the same kind of thing as faith. It is just the uh, uh, different aspect, uh, ta a word to talk about a different aspect of faith. Uh, so to say, repentance is the negative aspect of faith, and trust is the positive uh, uh, the positive uh, attribute of faith. Uh, and so uh, there we have, uh, you know, repentance. That, that's just fine with me. Um, then he goes to Matthew ten, uh, verse thirty-two through thirty-three. Uh, and uh, tries to say that confession is necessary. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, trying to say, uh, Matt is trying to say that confession is a necessary step in order to uh, receive forgiveness in order for us to be put into Christ. Uh, of course, the, the passage does not say this. The passage simply says that if we confess Christ before men, then he also will confess us before the Father. But it does not say that it is because of our confession. Uh, it says here that that those who Christ will confess before the Father, they also confess him before men. Uh, but this could just be a descriptive that those who are his will confess him before men. Those who Christ will confess before the Father, they are the kind of people who confess him before men. Uh, but it's not that he confesses them before the Father because they have confessed him before men. Uh, otherwise we would, you know, we would have some, uh, a, a contradiction of, uh, Romans chapter four of the, this, uh, uh, you know, we, we would have, you know, some trouble there. And, uh, from all that we've looked at so far, uh, and so likewise, those who deny him before men, uh, he will also deny before his father, which is in heaven. The kind of people who deny him before uh, men are the kind of people that he will deny before the father. And so uh, there, there we have, uh, there we have uh, that. Uh, next, he goes to Acts thirty-eight uh, two thirty-eight. Uh, in order to uh, begin uh, three passages on baptism and. Uh, uh, to say that baptism is needed for salvation. Uh, Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Uh, I just, uh, you know, kind of wanted to put that, that last verse in here because it is talking, uh, it, it's saying, uh, you know, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, even as many as, as he will call to himself, those who are his, uh, they have the promise of the Holy Ghost. They have the remission of sins because, or they, they will have it because it's promised to them. 
uh, because they are called of the Lord, because he calls them to himself. They are his elect people. And so, uh, you know, here, the, the point that Matt was, of, of course, bringing up with this is uh, that it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall have the Holy Ghost. Um, baptism here. Uh, there's a few things that can be noted about this uh, passage. Uh, first would be that there, uh, that uh, the remission of sins, and some have said this, uh, the remission of sins might not be paired with baptism, but with repentance in this passage. And that's because there is a, um, there is a, uh, a switch between second person plural in the uh, case of repentance, in the case of repent, and uh, third person singular in the case of baptism. It would, it would read, repent and be baptized. Uh, it would be, um, all of you repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And that, that comes out uh, pretty well in the uh, King James. Repent and be baptized every one of you, uh, talking individually to them. And uh, so uh, uh, creating a, a kind of um, aside here that Peter is going on, he, he says as his main point, repent. And then as uh, uh, this sort of side point, uh, and be baptized, uh, uh, every one of you be baptized, and then going back uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, and then going back to his main point, for the remission of sins. So repent for the remission of sins, and in the middle there, uh, be baptized every one of you in the name of, of Jesus Christ. So it, it, it might be, and it can be taken, that this is... Uh, uh, talking about uh, repentance unto the remission of sins and baptism as a command for the people uh, to do. Uh, another thing that, that some have noted that it, it could be um, is that the word for here, that if you don't take this other uh, you know this this first interpretation I've, I've you know just mentioned uh, is to to know that the word for which in the Greek is is uh, uh, it can mean not in order that uh, it, not the that that you're doing this in order that you receive the remission of sins but instead uh, because of or, or uh, uh, as a a um, uh, because you have the remission of sins or, or for the purpose that, that you have the remission of sins. Uh, in other words, that you are baptized because you have the remission of sins, not in order to get the remission of sins. Um, this is just a, a sort of a lexicographical, you know, uh, point uh, just to kind of say that the, the word east there ha does have this kind of unusual meaning sometimes, and it could be uh, the case here. And uh, so, uh, you know, there's that also. Um, I personally, um, as far as this goes, uh, I would just personally like to note who it is exactly that's speaking these words. It's Peter who, who's speaking the words here. Um, and Peter does give us, uh, in his writings, in 1 Peter, he does give us his uh, understanding of what baptism is and what it signifies. Uh, Peter did not have a view of baptism that the physical act of baptism uh, was the the cause of our salvation uh, or the the reason why we are uh, saved but rather he uh, he saw it as a picture of the work that Jesus Christ uh, has done for us and so uh, first Peter 3 verse 18 uh, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, he's uh, telling us about. Uh, uh, he's telling us about uh, uh, Jesus Christ's passion, his suffering, and his death, uh, and uh, he, he's beginning to to tell us uh, about that. Uh, and then he goes uh, on a a little bit of an aside from that in verse nineteen. 
by which, that is by his uh, being put to death in the flesh, uh, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Uh, he goes to this little aside. He says that Jesus went and he preached to these disobedient spirits, uh, and he identifies those spirits in the context with uh, those in the days of Noah, uh, when they they went to uh, and they took uh, to they saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took wives of all that they uh, that they chose, uh, and uh, that these were the the, the uh, spirits that he went to uh, preach in prison to. Uh, and so he goes on this little aside, and then here's the point uh, that I want to make in verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now, what is the figure in verse 21? What is it that baptism is figuring in verse 21 or that it is, uh, it is showing forth in verse 21? Uh, some would say, restorationists would say that it is the uh, flood of Noah and how uh, Noah was saved uh, th passing through the water that he was saved uh, with his family as far as, as physical salvation goes, uh, deliverance goes in, in, in the physical sense. Uh, but I, I would argue that it is referring to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what baptism is likened to throughout the rest of the, Old, uh, the New Testament. Uh, all of the other New Testament authors uh, that speak uh, on what baptism means. Uh, they liken baptism uh, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and I don't think that Peter is doing any differently. Uh, he is saying that baptism is the figure of Jesus Christ's passion for us. Uh, and so uh, he calls it a figure. Uh, that the, the, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. And he goes on, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, not the physical act, not taking a bath, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, the faith of that act, uh, the, 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 the faith that is demonstrated through that act, uh, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, not the physical act itself, but the faith in uh, the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here, I think, really shows us that the figure of baptism is Jesus Christ, because he was talking about uh, the death, burial, and uh, death and burial of Christ uh, up here. He goes into just a little aside about the, uh, the, the spirits that were imprisoned in the days of Noah. And then he talks about baptism. And in talking about baptism, he returns to the resurrection of Christ. So he's going through this death, burial, and resurrection. And he returns to the resurrection through the image of uh, uh, baptism that baptism represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, he, uh, he's returning to that, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. So the exaltation of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so here, Peter, and I think that this is a good word that we should maybe start using of baptism. He views baptism as a post-figurement. We talk about prefigurements. I believe he's talking about a post-figurement, uh, that this is an image of what Christ has done for us uh, that he uh, that is done after the fact, that is done after Jesus' passion uh, for us, after his uh, ascension into heaven. Uh, and so uh, his view of baptism is a symbol of what Christ has done for us. Uh, but it is not the symbol that saves us. It's the substance which the 
the baptism is symbolizing. And so if we just go back to uh, Acts 2.38 with that understanding, we can see that Peter is not shy about associating baptismal imagery with how it is uh, we are saved. But he does not think that baptism is the substance of, of, of uh, saving grace. Rather, it is a symbol. And yes, it can be uh, received at the same time as a person is converted to Christ. And I think that that's uh, pretty obvious uh, through the book of Acts. There, there were many people who received baptism uh, at the same time as they were uh, converted to Christ. And uh, uh and that, that in baptism they exercised faith toward God and they were saved, but it's not the physical act that saved them. So when we read Peter say, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, we should think about what Peter thought of baptism, that it is a symbol of our salvation. Uh, not to be disconnected with the substance, but it is not the substance itself. Uh, and so when we come here, we see this imagery. Uh, Peter is telling the people, uh, you know, what they should do. He's giving them practical uh, advice here, what they should do. He says, repent. That we said earlier was another way of talking about trust in Jesus Christ. He tells them to be baptized uh, every one of you. He tells them that they will receive the remission of sins and that they shall uh, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so that right there uh, should uh, uh, tell us what Peter is getting at here. That it's not the physical act, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The next passage that Matt uh, goes to is Acts 22 and verse 16. Uh, now why tarriest thou, this is speaking to Saul at his conversion, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, again, a passage he says is uh, telling us how it is uh, that, or that telling us that baptism is how remission of sins is uh, given. Uh, I'll just note quickly uh, that in verse 13, uh, Saul is called Brother Saul. Uh, Ananias calls him a brother before he was baptized. And some take this to mean that Saul was already converted uh, on, the, uh, on the, the road to uh, Damascus. And that uh, this uh, uh, Ananias calling him brother is confirmation of that, that he, he was already a brother. Um, it might be, uh, I'm not, I, I won't take any uh, hard stances on that. It could simply be that, uh, that uh, Saul was a, a fellow Jew, that he was calling him brother, you know, calling him, you know, kinfolk. Uh, or it could just be that he's, uh, you know, being polite or, or saying this with view to the uh, conversion of Saul, that God had already uh, begun to call him, uh, that God would surely bring him in because, uh, you know, because of because of his sure election that he would he would bring Saul in. Uh, but either way, uh, verse sixteen itself uh, in the original language tells us uh, what uh, makes a, a good distinction that we should keep in uh, mind. Uh, in the original language, the uh, the word K uh, in the verse only appears twice. Uh, it appears at the beginning of verse 16, and now why tarriest thou? And then it appears between baptized and wash away thy sins. Th those are the only two places that it, uh, it appears, the word and. And so uh, some have noted, and I would, I would follow them, uh, in this, that uh, arise and be baptized is one thing. Arise and be baptized. That's one thing that Paul is, is to do. And additionally, he is to wash away his sins calling on the name of the Lord. 
or, or by calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, so in other words, washing away of sins is not conjoined uh, as, as uh, being caused by baptism, but with calling on the name of the Lord, that is by faith in him, but by, by uh, uh, appealing to him for a good conscience. Uh, the answer of a good conscience toward God, is, as, as we read uh, a moment ago. This is by faith. Uh, and baptism is mentioned, of course, and we don't say uh, that people should not be baptized, uh, but that baptism is not said here to be the reason why Saul received the forgiveness of sins. And uh, so there we go uh, there. The final one that he mentioned, and this is just uh, really uh, quick, is Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned uh, uh, a very short verse and it's it's very simple to uh, to show that this is not saying that baptism is the way that we are saved uh, first because uh, there is an asymmetry uh, in asymmetry in the verse uh, belief and baptism are in the first half of the verse but only belief is in the second half of the verse. Uh, what Jesus' concern about was uh, primarily about belief, uh, that, that if a person uh, believes, then uh, that's, that's what he is uh, worried about. If they do not believe, they will be condemned. Um, and another thing uh, to, to note about this is that you could, um, uh, you can replace, uh, if if we take all of the rest of the scriptural witness about faith alone, that we are not saved by works, that we are saved by faith, uh, then uh, we can take baptized, uh, he that believeth and is baptized, we can take baptized and we can replace uh, other things with that. And the, the saying is still true. Uh, he that believeth and reads the Bible, shall be saved. He that believeth and prays daily shall be saved. Uh, he that believeth and uh, uh, takes up his uh, satchel and goes on a long journey or, or whatever, uh, he shall be saved, right? Uh, but we understand that those things are, are not necessary for our uh, salvation. Jesus' words here can be perfectly true, even if baptism is not taken as the occasion of our being declared righteous. So uh, here we have uh, uh, that the passage's emphasis is on belief and that the rest of the scriptural witness is for faith alone and that Jesus' words are perfectly true here, even if we do not take baptism to be the uh, necessary, a necessary condition to receive the forgiveness of sins. And uh, so uh, with that, I believe I've only got one more. Um, uh, I believe I've got two more uh, uh, little portions that I wanted to go over here. And so let's uh, let's get this back up. All right. Next question, Tanner. Uh, my question is: Does being spiritually dead mean my brain is incapable of rational thought? Does being totally depraved create a sort of mental deficiency or retardation when it comes to spiritual things? And what is the passage that says I have this mental deficiency? I assume put there by God. Okay, so from what Tanner's saying is we inherit spiritual death from Adam and Eve. And what I'm going to tell you is what Jesus said. Total depravity, he didn't say this, but total depravity is a false doctrine. So here's just a couple verses to combat this, okay? Matthew 19, chapter 19, and verse 14. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. They're not born in sin. They're not depraved when they're born. They're not depraved when they're little. So they have to go into sin. 
Okay, so they're not born. They're not born totally hereditary to pray. Uh, Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear, bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. That We didn't inherit Adam and Eve's sin. We didn't inherit their spiritual death. That happens when we make the choice, as Ezekiel 18, 20 and following state. state. Thank you. All right. So uh, very, uh, you know, short there. Uh, the response to total depravity is, is, is just underwhelming in this, uh, in this debate. Um, I wanted to, to bring this up because there, there were a couple of things I wanted to mention. He, he misses the point entirely here. Um, in the debate, and, and I think I... I I mentioned this um, that I, I I do not believe that an uh, an infant who dies uh, before the understanding of the law enters before uh, before they have opportunity to uh, uh, commit uh, acts of sin. Uh, I believe that uh, that uh, for them, if they die in infancy, then they go to be with the Father. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, redeems them uh, because of his love for them. Uh, but Matt framed total depravity, and, and I, I didn't really notice it until I went back and watched the debate. He framed total depravity uh, in a way that I didn't in the debate. Uh, or I did. I did partly. And I, and I, I was trying to, to defend... Uh, the, the idea that we inherit spiritual bondage from our parents and so we go off into sin. But uh, in order for, for the argument that I was making to, to avail uh, that because of our depravity, because of our enslavement to sin, uh, we cannot do that which is pleasing to God, uh, I don't even really, uh, you don't even really have to uh, accept the doctrine that we have inherited this bondage from our parents. All that is necessary is that we have sinned individually. We have sinned. Whosoever serveth a uh, sinneth is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever. Uh, that if, as we sin, we are dead in sin. Uh, we are the servants of Satan. We are his children. We are our captive at his will. Um, and, and, and that is all that's necessary to say that we could not do anything ourselves, even if you don't want to say that we inherited sin, the sin nature from our first parents. Nonetheless, you cannot deny that we have sinned. And since we've sinned, we are the servants of sin. And we cannot uh, get out of uh, that state by ourselves. And so it, 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 it kind of misses the point. And I would want to defend the, and I did defend in this, the, the, the doctrine that we have inherited this bondage from our parents. Uh, but nonetheless, Matt's objection, even if true, which is, it's not true, but even if true, it would do nothing to uh, to demonstrate that we can obey uh, these do these works of obedience in order to be saved because we have all sinned uh, and as uh, sinners as uh, dead in sin we cannot do uh, we cannot do what is pleasing to God and uh, so uh, there was that I just wanted to do that and then uh, I believe this is the uh, final. Uh, portion that I had uh, queued up for tonight, and uh, this is a doozy, uh, so uh, hold on, everybody. Okay, and uh, Tanner, if we are born children of the devil from the beginning, since all have sinned and there are none righteous, then how does one become born of God? Okay, so the question is, uh, then how does one become born of God? And here's my response. 
I want to point out that being born again would do us no good if we were born in sin the first time, totally depraved. Uh, if we were born totally hereditary depraved, then being born again would not help us at all. Okay, you want to be born again? You want to be washed of your sins? You need to obey the gospel plan of salvation that's taught through the scriptures. Um, and Peter says this. He mentions a couple obedient works that we need to do in order to be saved. Peter 1 in verse 22 and verse 23. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. We are born again through obeying the words given by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says. Uh, and that's how we're born um, in John 3, in verse 5, when it says you're born of water and the Spirit. Peter gives you a little bit of a commentary on what that is here in 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23. We're born again through the word of truth that was given by the Spirit. All right, so uh, there you go. Uh, he said uh, he said a little bit there and uh, the, the, the thing which struck me first and I hope struck all you first is that he said if we are born in depravity if we are born as he says totally hereditary depraved then being born again would do us no good that's the point Matt if we are born into sin we need to be born again. If our first birth was a birth into spiritual death, then we need to be born again. Uh, it, it, it just, it amazes me uh, that Matt would think that if we are, if we, if we are sinners, if we're born sinners, that, that then that we would need a savior. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he must have misspoken here. I'm sure he must have. I, I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on that. But I think Matt needs to repent of what he said there. Uh, that, that we are sinners and we need a savior. Uh, we are slaves to sin and we need to be made free from sin. Uh, depravity is the reason why we need a savior. Uh, Matt, sin is, is worse than you know, and it's worse than I know. And we need to, to turn to Jesus Christ and trust in him uh, completely because we need him. And uh, so I, I wanted to, to really push that. Um, he, he brought up a couple of verses here, and uh, we'll go to those uh, really quickly. Uh, first, he went to uh, 1 Peter 1. Uh, and I believe it was uh, verse 22 to 23, but I'll back up to verse 21 and we'll just walk through this passage and see what it's saying. It says, speaking of, uh, uh, speaking of, uh, of, uh, uh, speaking of us and, uh, in the light of what Jesus Christ has done, who by him, so we by him, Jesus Christ do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we, by Jesus Christ, believe in God. Because of what Christ has done, therefore we believe in God. Uh, it's, it's a statement of the, the work of God in giving us faith. Uh, our faith is not from ourselves, but it's from God. Uh, and so by God's activity, we believe in him, that our faith and hope might be in God. Verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for ever. Uh, 
here we do not see a statement about justification either. Uh, we see a statement about how uh, we obey the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren, unto loving one another, unto a closer bond within the body of Christ. Uh, and so we, we uh, you know, so he says, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, see that ye do this. Uh, and then he says in verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It does not say here that we have obeyed the truth in order to be born again. It just states it, that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the work of God that he did in verse 21, who by him believe in God. We by him do believe in God. He births us again. He uh, gives us a new heart, a new spirit. Uh, he brings us to life. He uh, begets us again through his working with the gospel. The working of God in the gospel, he brings us uh, to life again. And verse 24 uh, gives us a, 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 a wonderful statement that we should not rely uh, on ourselves in salvation, uh, but on God and God alone, only on his work. Verse 24, for all flesh is as grass. That's us. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. This is God working. The, the, the word of the Lord endures forever because the Lord endures forever. Uh, the word is never uh, disjuncted, uh, disjointed from his working. Uh, it's always uh, with his working. Uh, and so by his word, by the gospel going out, God does bring to spiritual life. And so uh, here we have not a statement that we have to obey uh, something, that we have to do, um, do works, uh, rather I should say, that we, we have to do works of obedience in order for God to love us and to uh, birth us uh, again and, and to make us new, but rather that God has loved us. God has given us faith in his son. He has brought us to spiritual life where we could not bring ourselves to spiritual life. And he has also purified our souls through causing us to obey through the spirit, giving us the spirit to obey his truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren, to a unity within the church. And so he says, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And that's the point of this passage here. The, the sovereignty of God flowing out into and his love flowing out into the salvation of his people, uh, not because of what they've done or their capacity, but because of his love for them and his mercy toward them. Uh, and having birthed us again, uh, he calls on us to enjoy the unity in the body of Christ. And so there is that passage. Uh, Matt uh, also just uh, quickly uh, uh, said a little bit about John 3. And uh, I'll just uh, go there just to close this out. John chapter 3 and uh, just going to uh, verse 3. Uh, talking to Nicodemus. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. 
Just a quick little exegesis of this. Uh, Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again. Nicodemus uh, seems to misunderstand or to, uh, 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 at the very least, uh, be critiquing Jesus' metaphor here. He says, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, and talking about physical birth and he, he, he you know, saying, well, it's impossible for uh, a physical birth to be in this, uh, to be physically born a second time. And Jesus uh, says to him uh, that a man must be born of water and be born of the spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. He makes a distinction between these two. They are in the same list. They both, of course, must be true of a person that they're born of water, that is the natural birth, and born of the spirit, which is a different kind of birth. And uh, he says, uh, unless both of these are true of a person, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Matt likes to say that this is water baptism. Uh, the context makes no reference to water baptism at all. Uh, but it's saying you must be born naturally and you must be born supernaturally through the spirit. Uh, he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And here's the statement of God's sovereignty. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Spirit blows where it wills. It doesn't blow where we will. We hear the sound of it, but we don't know where it's coming from, where it is going, what it's doing. And so is everyone that's born of the Spirit. We don't know how or when uh, or in, in what manner the Spirit will work in a person to bring them to spiritual life, but we know that he does it according to his own will. And uh, so with that, uh, we, we see that uh, it's not according to what we do. Uh, as, as, uh, as soon as a man can capture the wind uh, and cause it to blow where he wants it to blow, uh, and uh, not to blow where he doesn't want it to blow, uh, then uh, a man can be born of the Spirit at his own will. And even then, we're talking uh, spiritually. Uh, so uh, anyway, with that, uh, that was all that I had to uh, uh, look at uh, Matt's uh, replies there, what he was saying in the final night of the debate. Uh, this uh, third video has gone on uh, far longer than uh, I had anticipated it, just as the other two videos have. Uh, and uh, so hopefully this will be helpful to somebody. Uh, I don't mean, Matt, any ill will. If, uh, if any meanness leaked out of me over the course of this, then uh, I apologize with that. Just take the criticisms uh, as they are and uh, try to look past me in my flesh. And uh, hopefully it'll be useful to somebody. And uh, with that, we'll be doing some more stuff here in the future. Uh, if you're just coming to the channel, stick around, look at, look at some of the sermons that we have uh, up on the channel and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other stuff that we'll be doing soon. Uh, and so with that, uh, God bless and uh, stay safe.